God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And it, because we are here at Easter Sunday, beginning the Easter season, we will say this throughout the next five weeks. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We please join with me in prayer. Lord, on this Sunday morning, the first day of the week, we come, God, with our joys, with our concerns, with our uncertainties. We come to the grave. We come to the tomb. Help us to see the stone has been rolled away. Help us to look inside and see there is no body. Help us to wait in this moment and to hear you call our name, to know that you are alive, to know that death has lost its power, to know, God, that your love is with us today, tomorrow, this life, and eternally. Knowing that promise, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that you be with us in this worship right now. May our praises bring joy to you. May our songs give you joy. May this time and may our lives bring you honor and joy this day and always. It is in your most awesome and holy name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. We're glad that you all are with us this Sunday morning. A warm welcome to any guests that we might have. We're glad that you all are here. Please let us know that you are participating by leaving a comment in the chat feature or the message box on YouTube. Also, do not hesitate to contact the church office if you have any needs, any joys, any concerns, any things that we can walk beside you during the Easter season, but also any time at all. Again, being Easter Sunday, we have a special offering that we are uh, collecting this year. We collect it every year. It's called the One Great Hour of Sharing Offering. The money goes to support Presbyterian Disaster Assistance in their valuable and important work dealing with natural disasters, dealing with human-made disasters, locally, nationally, and internationally. If you are giving a gift to this, please make a note so we make sure that we allocate it to the right place. Also, this being the first Sunday of Easter, the first day of Easter, we have wrapped up our Lenten journey. That means that uh, for those of you who have participated in the Lenten Clean Water Challenge by only drinking uh, tap water over the last 40 days, please make note, take uh, stock of how much you have saved by foregoing coffee or, or uh, adult beverages or soda and next week, we will be collecting the offering for the Lenten Water Challenge, and all that money will go to Marion Medical Mission and the good work they do by digging clean water wells in Africa. Last year, our church was able to support the, the digging of 15 wells. We believe we can do even more than that this year, so please consider giving to that uh, this next week. Again, there's a lot of things going on here at the church as we get into the Easter season. Please take note of what we have in the bulletin, what we have online. And if you ever have any questions, please contact the church office. Now let us continue in our worship with the call to worship. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Would you please join us in the singing of our first hymn? If you have a hymnal, it is 232. It's a wonderful Easter hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today.
long-awaited words, Christ is risen and Christ is risen indeed, and Alleluia. We have waited for these words, for this opportunity to exclaim Alleluia. Jesus rising from the dead assures us new life. We have been given that new life. Let us repent of our sin now before God and one another, certain in God's mercy. Let us pray. All-knowing, all-powerful God, we confess that even on this most holy day, we are unable to believe in the victory over death shown to us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We confess our utter dependence on you, not only for life, but also for faith, hope, and love. Without your astonishing appearance to our ancestors and your stunning presence throughout the ages, we would be lost. Forgive us and transform us that in every way our work and prayer will make whole what is broken and give peace on earth. Let us now take a moment for silent confession. By the grace of God and the witness of our ancestors, the good news of Jesus' resurrection is our rock and our salvation. You shall not die, but you shall live. The rejected cornerstone has become your strength and your song. I declare to you the forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God who lives and who reigns as mother of us all, now and forever. And because we are forgiven people and we share in God's peace through Jesus Christ, I declare to you the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all this morning. And also with you. Let us take a moment now and share God's holy Easter peace with one another. Will you please join with me in prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock, our salvation, our sustainer. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning is likely a familiar one. We've likely heard it many times before, but my encouragement is with open ears, and with a soft heart that you and I, that we might hear this again. We might hear this resurrection message anew. Our reading is from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw, she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and she went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, followed him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead and then the disciples returned to their homes 
But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. And I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father. And your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May this God's word speak to our hearts, our minds, our spirits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Should I stay or should I go? Shall we open the doors? Shall we go in? This is a question that many of us have asked in the world. Many of us have asked inside the church over the last several months. When will the doors be open? When can we go inside? And here we have in our text this morning, The unexpected door being opened. The unexpected stone being rolled away. The unexpected invitation to come inside. We ask that question, when can things go back to normal? When can we go back to the way things used to be? But Easter Sunday is about, if it is about anything else, it is about the great truth that we can go but it's never going back. We can go to those familiar places, but we will see they have changed. They are no longer the same. We can go back. The doors can be open, but the thing to which we enter will never be the same, should never be the same. The former things have passed away on this Easter Sunday. The new things have come. Going to the tomb, going into the tomb allows us to see, allows us to see that we can never go back. Resurrection means everything has changed. And John's retelling, John's account of the resurrection story in John chapter 20 is perhaps the best known of the four Gospels. I believe it is the most immersive. We hear very, very little little about Peter and John, or we assume it's John, the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. They don't get a speaking part. The angels get to ask one question, but this is really a passage about the interaction between Mary Magdalene and the risen teacher, the risen rabbi, the risen Lord. In it, the story begins with walking. It's early on the first day of the week, and Mary Magdalene is walking to the tomb. I don't even think walking is the right description. I see it more as limping, as struggling, struggling. I'm sure there has not been a lot of sleep over the last three days, and she makes her way slowly to the tomb. And on this Easter Sunday, I know that 
that some of you have been journeying with us every Sunday during Lent, every Sunday as we've been meeting online during the pandemic. I know others have been joining us maybe just at Christmas or Easter or maybe one or two other times. The point is we're all welcome here on Easter morning. We're all welcomed here. We're glad that you are here. I'm willing there is a desire in everyone's heart. Those who come every week, those who come periodically, there's a desire in everyone's heart for something more, something deeper, something real. Walking, limping to the tomb, it is a start. It is an important start. We're glad that you all are here. But the Easter invitation is, is not just to walk or just to limp. It is so much more and is so much bigger than we could ever imagine. And the good news this morning is it is for you. It is for you. And yet we could say the past three days have been hard. The past three days, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, they were hard for us, how much harder they were for Mary Magdalene, for the other disciples, and still she limps in the early, in the early darkness, the, as the, the sun is not yet rising, she limps to the tomb, she still makes her way. The past year has been hard for all of us, a collective suffering, and yet we are here this morning limping in, the walking wounded at this point. And I think in Mary Magdalene, we have a wonderful example, a wonderful encouragement as the story begins today. It is the first day of the week, but it is still dark. And Mary makes her way to the tomb in the midst of her grief, in the midst of her disappointment, in the midst of her immeasurable pain. She still comes to the tomb. Is it to mourn? To remember? Perhaps she comes to this place of death somewhere in her remembering or somewhere in her holding on to a lingering hope that something is going to happen. She's moving forward the Sunday morning. It brings to mind a quote by Martin Luther King Jr. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. I don't see Mary rushing to the tomb. I think it takes everything in her to limp, to crawl to the tomb. But the point is Mary is moving forward. And unbeknownst to her, she is not the only one who's moving. And it's not the only thing that has been moved. She comes to the tomb. She comes to the tomb in her sleepy eyes, her tear-soaked eyes. She likely does a double take. She sees the stone has been removed from its place. Something is amiss. Something is not right. And the feet that limp to the tomb now run back to Simon Peter and to the other disciples. The body is gone. And now the race is on. The two disciples, they get up. They begin to run. The other disciple getting there first. Peter getting there second. The first disciple looking into the tomb, seeing things in order. But Peter then going in, soon followed by the other disciple, and entering into the tomb. Walking and limping here today, it is a start. It's a good start. But the next step, is looking into the tomb, examining the evidence, looking in and see, is there something there for me in the empty tomb? We, at our core, have a hunger for resurrection. We, at the, the base level of our spirits, have a yearning, a desire for rebirth and for renewal this is how we are wired this is how we are made its symptoms are recognizable this yearning in our hearts even if it is hard to identify its origins 
but like the rumblings in, say, a 10-year-old boy's stomach who is always hungry, always craving something to satisfy the, the growing pains of, of an empty stomach that was recently filled, but it seems to be insatiable. Like those groans from the stomach, so our spirit groans for something more. We are created for growth. We are created for resurrection. We are created for the point of moving forward. And so it is with those groans of the human spirit crying out from our souls. That's crying out not just for the temporary, not just for the things of this life. It is crying out for something beyond and crying out for us to move beyond. Beyond today, beyond this life, and beyond this world. And the good news is that God does not give us a hunger for this without the means of God satisfying that hunger. God does not give us a yearning for resurrection without the ability to make that manifest, to make that happen. I've always been comforted by the words of St. Augustine, who writes, You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. God has made us for God's self, and our hearts are restless, our spirits are restless, our souls are restless until they find their rest in Jesus, until they find their rest in the God who created, and the God who redeemed, the God who resurrected, and the God who sustains. Our deepest hunger is for restoration, for relationship, and for resurrection many can hear it but it is the dim echoes as if we were in a cave we we think it's coming from someplace else and so we try to satisfy it with other things fill in those gaps with the empty calories of the world but it is our souls our spirits crying out for this good news that we begin to see with the light breaking on this most holy of days what will we find at the tomb? What will we find in the tomb is what we're going to find in our spirit. John looks in first. Peter goes in, and then John comes in later. They see everything is in surprising order, decent, and in order the, the linens are wrapped up. They are separated one from another but there is no body. They are perplexed. They believe at some point, but they don't understand. And then perplexing maybe to us, they just go home. They know something has happened. They just don't know yet what. But Mary, Mary remains. In the midst of so much running left and right, up and down, racing back and forth, it is Mary who is still, and it is Mary as she is still there that re begins to reveal the fullness of this morning. She looks in, and she sees two angels there, one at the top, one at the bottom of that burial slab. And they say, woman, why are you weeping? And then she, she turns, and she sees what she supposes to be the gardener, and and the gardener asks, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? And Mary pleads, thinking again, this is the gardener, and says, if you have taken him away, just let me know. Let me know, and, and I'll go get the body. If you've taken him away, let me go back. Let me, let me go back, maybe, to the way things once were. And then Jesus says one word to her. One word that changes everything. He says, Mary. He had called her woman up until this point, but he says, Mary. In an instant, an instant, she sees, she sees that this is not just Jesus. This is not just the resurrected Son of God. This is her Rabunai. This is her teacher. The relationship has changed. It has been resurrected it is something 
more now. Because up until this point, Jesus had those 12 disciples, but married this woman who would never be a disciple in the way of the former world, the former things. When she hears Jesus call her name, she cannot say anything but teacher, but rabbi, and thus, thus she is the student, thus she is the follower, thus she is the disciple. It is Mary staying by the tomb that makes the difference, sitting with her tears, honest with the weight of the last three days, with the pain, with the disappointment, with the grief. That in that moment, Mary who has walked, who has limped, Mary who has looked in, it is Mary now who leaps, it would seem, for joy. Leaps for joy because she has seen the Lord. She has seen the signs of resurrection, but more than that, she has heard the resurrected teacher say her name and call her name. She leaps for joy, we can imagine, but also she leaps into a whole new world, a whole new reality, a whole new light. You might have limped in here this morning. You might have just barely made it. You might have even thought, well, maybe I'll just catch it later or, or maybe I'll worry about, about going to worship at another time. If you've limped in here, you're in the right place. If you struggled because of the, the events of the last three days in your life or the last year, or whatever pain you bring, you're in the right place. Because when you limp, you begin to look. And when you look, you begin to see. And when you see, you begin to understand. And if you wait, you will hear your name. And you know it is the voice of the resurrected Savior. You know it is the voice of the teacher. You know it is the voice of that echo, of that cry that comes from your spirit desiring something bigger than today, bigger than this life, bigger than anything we could ever imagine, the thing for which we were created. I invite you to keep looking to look in the tomb, to look in your hearts, to look for that thing which, for which you long for most in, the life, in this life and see in this empty place of death the promise of a new life. Wait in this moment. Wait for the Lord. Wait even in your weeping. And may you hear the Lord calling your name. May you know it is the risen Savior who knows you wholly and completely our hope friends remains for doors to be open but it's not to go back to the former things we don't go back to this tomb to mourn death we limp we look we wait and then we leap on this day of resurrection on this easter sunday don't long for the way things once more Rejoice. Rejoice. We have something so much better on this day, this first day of the week. Mary has seen the Lord. May we keep looking. May we keep listening. And may we hear God call our names. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite you to please rise as you are able. Our affirmation of faith this morning comes to us from the Westminster Confession of Faith, Shorter Catechism, question number one. What is our chief end? Our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. With compassion for our needs, the Risen One stands beside us, calling our names. Let us, with the same mercy, bring forth tithes and offerings to relieve the suffering of this world and to proclaim far and wide the good news of resurrected life. Let us pray. 
Holy God, you shower us with gifts so abundant we cannot measure them all. You give us life itself. Bless these gifts for the sake of those in need. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we prepare to celebrate Holy Communion together, I invite you to please prepare the elements to get them ready in your homes, the bread and the cup. A reminder that this is not a table just for St. Mark. It is not just a table for Presbyterians. It is not just a, a table that we have. It is the Lord's table. And our risen God invites us again and again, but invites all those simply who recognize there is a longing in their hearts. There is a longing in their spirit, a cry, a groan in their spirit for something more, something beyond this day. The invitation, the only requirement is for us to acknowledge our hunger and our God bids us to come. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from north and from south, from east and from west to be at this table in the kingdom of our Lord. According to the Gospel of Luke, on Easter Sunday, later on in the day, later on in the story that we heard today, Jesus is walking with two disciples. They walk all day long, but the two disciples never recognize it's Jesus. Like Mary, he is somehow obscured from them. But at the end of a long day's walk, they sit down to eat on, after the Emmaus Road. And Jesus, he takes the bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, he gives it to them. And when they received it, their eyes are open. And they say, wasn't it Jesus who had been with us the whole time? They recognize that it was the Lord who had been with them on that journey. It was the Lord who was with them now. This is the Lord's table. Our God invites all those 
who trust in him to share in this feast which he continues to provide. Let us pray together. With joy we pray this Easter morning for all the world and for all Christian assemblies united this morning at the empty tomb. Help us to see you, O God, and those we do not expect to encounter and remove all fears from our hearts. It is with gratitude we give you thanks. Thanks for those longtime members of the church and thanks also, Lord, for the guest we have this morning. We ask that you guide all of us and keep us and open our eyes again and again to your blessing. And it is with humility, Lord, we pray for this planet that you created, this planet that you called home. Heal that which we have scarred and broken. Renew the face of the earth from north to south, from east to west so that your creation may speak to us of your goodness. And we hope, God, we hope and we pray for the nations of the world, especially those places overwhelmed by war and conflict, for those places ravaged during this pandemic, for those people who are underserved and under-equipped and overlooked. By the light of the resurrection, destroy the shroud that is cast over all who live in painful places. We ask God that you would bless the peacemakers who work to bring justice to countries and cities, villages, and homes. And with compassion, we ask that you wipe away the tears of all who weep. Give us the spiritual tools we need to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, comfort those who are in trouble. Send your angels to watch over the vulnerable and the sick. And Lord, in this time of being still, we ask that you would hear us as we lift up our individual concerns to you, our joys, our sorrows, our, our, our anxieties, our worries. Be with us now as we wait on you. Loving God, we give you thanks that you are not only the God who calls, but you are the one who calls us by name and calls us into a new relationship with you and one another. We ask, Lord, in humility that you answer these prayers, that you be near all the concerns raised, that you be close. We ask this in the name of your Son, the first fruit of resurrection the one who lives and the one who is always with us and who taught all disciples to pray one prayer together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He thanked God for it and then he broke it. And he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after dinner, Jesus shared the cup with his disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. For as often as we, his disciples, we eat of this bread 
and drink of this cup, we proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus until he comes again. I'm going to invite you to please get the bread ready at your homes and know that this is God's gift of love for you. Let us partake of Christ's body. This also is a gift of God's love for us. This represents Jesus' blood for the forgiveness of sins, the cup of salvation. Will you pray with me? Holy God, creator of all, the risen Christ taught us from Scripture of his death, resurrection, and ascension into your glorious presence. May the living Lord breathe on us his peace, that our eyes may be open to recognize him in breaking bread and to follow wherever he leaves, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. To rise and sing together, Christ is risen, shout Hosanna. And now that you have heard this good news, now hopefully as you believe this good news, you hear Jesus call your name, knowing you will not be the same. Go out into the world announcing that I have seen the Lord, but also showing that you have seen the Lord, showing in your resurrected life, in your resurrected relationships, in your resurrected hope, Go out into the world and be the church this Easter. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may it be with you this day, this life, and always. Alleluia. Amen.
Joyful, joyful, the Lord is alive. Go now, be joyful, joyful, the Lord is alive. Be joyful, joyful, the Lord is alive. Go now, be joyful, joyful, the Lord is alive.